This is a Radiola 528MA made by AWA in about 1950. It's a dual wave set with a pickup input so it has the broadcast band and short wave on it. Being that earlier set it um, doesn't have any ferrite rod aerial on it and also the spacing in radio stations here has TCH on 1190 instead of 1170. So that gives an idea of the age of it. A friend gave it to me last year. He didn't want it back and he thought I could have some fun with it. And when I first got it, it was working, but it was sounding very thin. And there was a lot of feedback when the volume control was advanced. And it was quite um, narrow, the audio too. There was very little bass in it. So I've started replacing a lot of capacitors in them. A lot of paper capacitors, some of which had their cases cracked a few electrolytics and it's going again as you can hear the union movement likes to claim tradies and contractors who mind you somebody on a telephone doesn't sound so great but we'll hear the studio announcer's voice again soon I hope people have made the union movement's just upset because most of these people they're referring to have no interest in becoming union members Australia's biggest miners called for substantial change to the GST distribution system Jacob Cagey reports in a submission to the productivity commission BHP warns the existing GST distribution system is Anyway, it's not sounding too bad, but there's still a bit of things to do on it, and it's about 40 kc out the dial, so the local oscillator is going to need a bit of realignment at least. This particular set, there was a 527MA as well that didn't have short wave on it, but this one that does. For the converter oscillator, it uses an X61M valve, a 6AR7 GTIF amp detector and AVC, the first AF amp is a 6AU6 and the output tube is 6V6. The rectifier is a 5Y3. The difference with the 527MA, apart from getting rid of all that complicated band switching to get short wave, is that the converter is a 6A8G instead. Anyhow, I'll uh, just to let you have another listen to it and then we'll go and have a look inside and I'll show you what I've done so far and then we'll progress along with the uh, repair stroke restoration of it. I've given the cabinet a bit of a clean up, but I'm um, primarily interested in the uh, electronic restoration of it uh, more than the cabinet at this stage anyway. Appropriate behaviour. The Australia A cricket side's boycotting its tour of South Africa because of the ongoing pay dispute. It's the first time an Aussie cricket team's chosen to boycott a tour. Former Test cricketer Nathan Bracken says aspiring cricketers will be hurt most. That's a uh, 50 kilowatt station on the outskirts of Sydney. Uh, we're approximately 90 kilometres from Sydney here, by road anyway, and that particular station's probably about by air 40 to 50 kilometres away. Snow on the Alps and the chance of a late shower in the state's far northwest. Cities forecast to be fine for the rest of the day. Tomorrow, sunny, a top of 18. Right now, 17 degrees in the city, 18 in the west. I've got the back off the receiver now, so I'll swing it around and show you what's been done. Uh, by the way, the radio is sitting on top of a turntable, which is otherwise known as a lazy Susan and I don't know how it got that name the turntable's fine with me but um, if you want to buy one if you look up lazy Susans they're quite common you can buy just the bearing section if you like or you can borrow buy the whole thing and they're not expensive and I tell you what though it makes a heck of a difference because you can you can turn this around just with a little finger and get to the back of the radio really easily And when you're servicing these things, you're moving them around quite a bit, and it makes it so much easier to do that. Anyhow, um, what you can see here for a start is that there's a bit missing at the bottom of the case. Just in there, it has been uh, broken, and I did do quite a bit of gluing to reassemble the uh, pieces there. So it's a bit of a Humpty Dumpty job on that corner. But um, as it's in that part of the radio, you don't really get to see it, so it's not too much of a problem. Uh, when I get the chassis out of the box, I'll show you that in more detail. The other thing you can notice, or you might be able to notice, 
is that there's new uh, insulation spaghetti on these wires here. The original insulation on these wires was rubber, which has had plenty of time to perish from 1950 to 2017. And so uh, what was left on those wires of insulation was just cracking and falling off, so it wasn't doing much at all. So I've replaced all that. And the other thing about this radio, which is interesting, that you won't find on later radios, is there's no permanent magnet on the speaker. It's um, a field speaker, meaning that the uh, excitation for the DC field comes from the high tension supply in the radio. So the high tension supply goes to the field magnet and also the speaker transformer, not just the speaker transformer. And so the speaker magnet, the field magnet itself, can be thought of as a type of choke, which in addition with the electrolytic capacitors gives you filtering for the power supply. And even this set being 1950, uh, by then a lot of permanent magnet speakers had already started to come in. So I was surprised when I looked up the date of this radio that it actually wasn't more of a mid, well, mid 40s radio rather than um, a 1950 radio. Um, and some restoration work, or at least repair work, had been done on it in the past in that they'd replaced some of the paper capacitors with uh, plastic dielectric capacitors. And I would say in the 1960s it was probably done because of the um, components that were used then were very common in that era. I've got a lot of those same type of components, so I'm trying to continue the current repair of it with those components so there's some degree of uniformity in what they look like. I haven't gone to the trouble of putting the components in the original um, uh, configuration uh, tubes if they're paper capacitors, uh, putting the plastic capa film capacitors inside paper capacitor um, tubes or anything like that because I think it takes a lot of time to do. The radio doesn't sound any different whether you put them in there or not. Um, from a point of view of restoration, yes, it probably does look more authentic, but um, when you consider that the primary reason that the radio was made in the first place was performance, if I can restore the performance of that radio with modern components and it runs really well, then we can experience these days what it was like to have a receiver like this made a long time ago uh, running in contemporary times um, to to look at underneath the chassis which is a bit of a problem with this to even do in the normal course of events it doesn't really give me a buzz to see original components at all and especially when you consider on top of that that a lot of those original components have failed um, I don't know <laughs> that there's much point in trying to remember um, what they were originally like because they have long well by uh, exceeded their use by date. Anyhow I'll uh, show you under the chassis and um, you can see what's been done and what I'm continuing to do with it. Okay you can see the radio has had the case removed. I'll show you I was speaking about with the repair to the case. If you can see it in there, there's a crack in that area. It goes right to the front of the radio and I've uh, glued that up with Araldite, the two-part epoxy glue. And with the chassis now, you can probably more clearly see the new installation on these wires. And spin it around. And you can see just in here, hopefully, the wires going to the field coil. Also, there's a uh, electrolytic capacitor there, one of the can type. This one has cardboard on the outside. And although probably won't be continuing to use it. I'll uh, leave it there. It looks reasonably um, complete then. And there's the, the front of the radio. 
Again, I just move the light out of the way. <laughs> and um, around the speaker here, on the masonite, there was a rubber, yeah, what would you call it, a rubber seal, which of course that had fallen apart too with age. Yeah, to seal the this area onto the cabinet to uh, give a bit better uh, isolation between the front and the back of the speaker. It's sounding reasonably good without it, but I'll substitute something for that. Anyhow, I'll show you the underside of the radio now. Right, the underside of the radio. Now, you can see a lot of the capacitors that I have replaced. These are Ducon. Uh, polycarbonate capacitors, I think they are, from the 1960s. Um, looking at these ones that I'm talking about. And that. Um, some of them had been replaced when I uh, started fixing this radio at a previous stage. So I'm continuing uh, to be using those types. I've got a couple of um, radio lead electrolytics in there, so I'm going to change them with axials like this one that I've replaced. Um, to make it look a bit more of um, that that era of components. Um, there's a few mica capacitors there that I'm not happy with. These are the original paper ones, uh, which, although they're working, you sort of think, you know, you're going to give the radio a bit more longevity if you replace them before you're going to have to um, take it apart and replace them anyway. Uh, there's a few uh, resistors which have gone high, which is pretty normal, uh, but um, that probably won't make that much difference to the performance, at least in the audio amplifier. But I'll go and double check what their values are, and if they're too high, I'll replace them too. There's a capacitor, a coupling capacitor in the audio amplifier, which was causing the poor frequency response. You remember I was saying that when I got the radio it was working but it sounded quite thin and had a lot of uh, feedback when you turned up the volume control. And um, I'll just uh, show you where that capacitor is and uh, tell you what the original problem with it was. Okay, this is me trying to do a bit of a steady cam unit with this camera anyhow. The capacitor is this one, C33, that was causing the poor audio frequency response. Back when the previous person had repaired it, instead of putting a 0.02 in there, they'd put a 0.002. So they'd really restricted the low end of the frequency response. So when I put a 0.02 in there, after I found that it was faulty anyway, it made a big difference. Now on the lower left of the two electrolytics, I'm going to replace those um, radial lead electrolytics with and there's a few of the other components that I'm going to replace. Anyhow, I'll see if I can give you a reasonably steady close-up of the electronics. I've replaced quite a few components in the power supply and the audio amplifier now and had some interesting discoveries like the valve lineup is a little bit different to what the original is and the power transformer is different from what the original is and the mains voltage in Australia is uh, 230 in this area whereas of course it was 240 for um, most of the uh, the time that we've had power in Australia, but in recent times they've made it 2.30 to get closer to the European voltages for European appliances. So that means when you're measuring high tension voltages throughout the set, there will be a difference, especially when they change the power transformer. So I'll show you a little bit more about that uh, later too. But uh, with most of the audio components now replaced and or tested, I've uh, found a problem with the tone control, this one here, and I'll give you a look at uh, what that is uh, looking like on the oscilloscope uh, next. 
so I've got a 1k sine wave there uh, which you can see on the oscilloscope and that's coming from this generator here and if I change that to a square wave instead I can do that you can see that it's reasonably square it has got a little bit of hum on it but that's another issue I'll talk about when I come to describing the power supply in a bit more detail but if I so that's one kilohertz square wave if I change the tone control you'll see what happens it's increasing it back to around about the center and decreasing it now the tone control is actually faulty in that it's hopping from minimum resistance up to that area and at the high end so there's actually a fault in the tone control it needs replacing it has got a main switch on the back of it which I haven't got 100k pop with a main switch on now so I have to forget about the main switch side of it and that was one of the things that was causing the instability in the amplifier in fact it measures nearly 600k at the high end where it gives that effect so that should help stabilize that also uh, looking at the frequency response of the amplifier generally I'll show you um, uh, back to sine wave and I'll show you what that's like so we're down at 100 Hertz now and I've got it adjusted so that's 8 divisions if I jump up to 1K that's not 1K, that's triangular there we go so I'll do that again 100 Hertz, 1K and 10K 1K, 100 and 10 Hertz not much there. So obviously there's a peak there at 100 Hertz. So I'll go back to 1K and if I lift that up to say 3K I've got another 20 Hertz generator here which you can see the digital readout on and I've got that so I can sweep the generator you're listening to at a 20 Hertz rate. So that's now sweeping the, the oscillator you saw before at a 20 hertz rate and I can increase or decrease the amplitude as you can hear. So if I put the oscilloscope in XY mode like that, that's actually giving you a readout of the frequency response swept around the center frequency. If I drop the sweeping voltage back that's the base frequency that we're sweeping from which in this case is 3k and it'll sweep either side of that so I'll now increase this, the sweep amplitude Trying to get things looking symmetrical for you. So anyway, as I hope you can hopefully see, and it's probably a bit noisy if I'm trying to speak over it, the, um, 
that gives you an idea of the frequency response of the whole audio amplifier. Peaking down the 100 hertz hen and uh, running out about 5 or 6k it's running out to at the moment. The exact, what these exact frequencies are isn't so important at this stage other than to say that the response isn't flat. There's a little bit of hum sitting on the top of that, but that's not a significant problem at the moment. But it does graphically show you what happens with the tone control, uh, which I'll demonstrate now. Turning it up, you see that the peak around 3K, 2 to 3K, going back to the middle part of the range. And that's the low end where it just crunches out all the treble altogether. So anyhow, I don't expect to get a flat response out of this amplifier, but I expect to get something that's a bit more controllable with the tone control. So what I'll do now is replace that 100k pot for the tone control, and hopefully it shouldn't shouldn't do that sort of thing anymore. And I should be able to more accurately control the treble in. And I'll come back and show you what that looks like. And then I'll describe what's happening in the power supply department. Okay, I've replaced the tone control potentiometer now with another 100k. This time um, there's no switch on the back of it for the mains on off. But that doesn't matter with this set. I usually just turn it on and off at the main switch anyway rather than at the set. So here's what the audio spectrum looks like now. And it, as before it cuts down a lot of the treble at the bass end and actually boosts the treble at the top end. But it's quite controllable, rather than hopping. So if I put the control in about the middle, and then go back to square wave, and one kilohertz, and stop sweeping it. Treble up. Notice how it's not jumping now, but it's controllable. And treble cut the other way, which is also controllable. So the way this treble control is configured is not just as a treble cut control, it's a treble boost or treble cut control. So to get the full range, it's not a matter of putting the treble control up to maximum it's putting the treble control in the minimum and that gives the most even range. I'll show you what I've been um, replacing on the component side and a little bit about the power supply next. Okay we're getting a bit of a lighting problem here but hopefully you can see what's going on. I've replaced a lot of components in the audio amplifier and the power supply. I uh, have found a problem in getting Axial lead electrolytic capacitors these days actually axial lead any capacitors and the original input capacitor to the filter on the power supply was an 8 microfarad originally and then a 16 after the choke. The choke in this case is the field coil so you might be able to see that there. This is a relevant section an 8 and a 16 well these days that's more likely to be a 10 and a 20 because it's even hard to get 8 and 16 microfarad electrolytics. So at the moment the 8 is represented by this 10 here and the 20 is represented by those two 10s there. I'll substitute those two here for a 20 soon and probably put one of these axials up here so it'll look a little bit neater. A lot of the capacitors in the audio amplifier have been replaced the 470k resistors have been, the 250k, it's almost a rebuild. There's a few resistors that I kept the original components. 
Anyhow, getting on to voltages, I've got this on a Variac at the moment, so it is actually getting 240 on the input and not 230. And the high tension voltage, which I'm measuring here, which hopefully you'll see on the meter, is uh, varying between about 214 and 215 volts. Now it's meant to be higher than that, it's meant to be up around 260 volts. And the high tension for the plate is meant to be 240, 20 volts difference. Well, I don't get that much difference. I'll go onto the plate, which is there. I'm getting 200 at the moment, 201. Just make sure the variax is in the right place, maybe 202. So I'm getting about 12 volts difference between the plate and the screen. And what you're seeing here is the ripple on the high tension supply. I know it's almost out of the frame there. I'll see if I can go forward a little bit with the camera without getting too much shine. So this is a times 10 probe and it's on 50 millivolts of division. So it's 500 millivolts of division. So it's less than half a volt ripple with those two capacitors, which is pretty good. Uh, as I was suggesting before, the high tension transformer is different than it should be. It's instead of a 325 volt AC aside transformer, it's a 310 volt aside transformer, which really means there's 35 volts less peak coming out of it. So that knocks the 240 on the plate down to 205, which is pretty close to where it is at 202. And um, the 260, it would make at 225, but then there'd be 20 volts difference between the plate and the screen, and I'm only getting about 12. So it's not worth trying to pursue any further there. The other things I've found on the radio is that I said it's got an X61 converter. Well, it's supposed to have an X61 converter. In fact, it's got a 6A8 converter the same as the 527, which wasn't the dual wave set, has. So they're using one of them instead. And the IF amp, instead of being a 6AR7, which it was in both the 527 and the 528 radios, it's an EBF35. OK, I've started replacing a few components around the IF amplifier section and I'm now testing it. There was a bit of a um, problem with unequal sensitivity before, Ooh. whereby the sensitivity at the high end of the broadcast band wasn't the same as at the low end of the broadcast band. So something was getting out of tune, and I found a few capacitors, if not so much out of value, but definitely leaky. So. I've got the IF amplifier swept here through 455kc and um, as you can see on the oscilloscope that's the uh, pass curve of the IF amp. What I'm doing here, this is a uh, generator which is being swept by this generator at a 33Hz rate using a triangular wave. So I'm feeding that to the horizontal plates of the crow and I'm feeding a proportion of it into the sweep input of this oscillator. If I stop the sweeping you'll see that we're not quite symmetrical on the curve there. Let's have a look if I can do that. There we go, that's symmetrical on the curve. So that's no sweeping and 455. That's that's the frequency, as you can see, that it's tuned to, 455. So as I increase the sweep, and it's not quite so much further. You can see the curve opening up there. And um, we can change the sweep rate so that we're sweeping further or less. We're getting really fussy here, trying to get that in the middle. Anyway, so we left it there. 
And you might say, how do I know what frequency I'm on? Well, I've got a normal signal generator here. I'll just bring it back to the right. Um, and normal signal generator. Uh, an RS signal generator which can be modulated. And I'm using it as a marker. So if I bring the output level up, you can see it's causing an interference pattern at the bottom of that waveform which I can run up to the left hand side of the waveform through the bottom and up to the right I can increase it a bit too so it's a bit more dramatic I'll let you hear that a bit more. probably doesn't have to be that drastic pull it back a bit so if I put it in the middle of the waveform there close to it and read the frequency off the counter I'll turn that down. I've got a frequency counter connected to the signal generator because the dial of the signal generator is not that accurate and it's 453.1 kc now I found actually this is difficult this set to align to 455 it's the uh, the cores need to be wound too far out so um, there's probably uh, some more components I'm going to have to replace that will fix that but I can show you um, something of the bandpass characteristic too if I went down to this part of the curve so around there that's 445.8 well, if we made it 446 it might be a bit easier to... hmm. so that's 446 and we're just starting to come down the curve through 453 so that was what 7kc down so if it was symmetrical we could go 7kc up to that corner now it's going to be more like 462 so it's about 6kc up here we can increase the amplitude 6kc up and 7kc down so it's not quite symmetrical but as you turn the IFs around, I'll go back to 453. Over there, whoops. The okay, and um, you can see that that's close to what we have tuned to. I won't bother mucking around too much retuning the IFs and giving demos of it all yet because um, they're going to have to be retuned to 455 when I get the rest of the components replaced anyway. But I thought you might have to, um, uh, or rather you'd like to have a look at what the waveform looks like when sweeping it like that. Of course the normal sort of display and alignment that you'd use if I turn that signal generator down and that put the modulator on this one that's the normal 400 Hertz tone which if I AC coupled it and increase the amplitude a bit that's where the IF is tuned at the moment and normally you'd peak that with the IF transformers as usual anyway it looks like it's back to the um, not the drawing board but back to the bench and replace a few more components in the RF and IF section and then come back and show you how that has affected it and then we can complete the alignment and that should be about it
anyway thanks for watching and bye for now